gift of motherhood. She said, Noni, you will give birth to many people as Fatimai gave birth today. And Fatimai gave her the majestic sands and the lush forests. But Fatimai did not neglect her other daughter, Azura. To you, my favored daughter, Fatimai leaves her greatest gift. To you, Fatimai leaves her secrets. When Noni is filled with her children, take one of them and change them. Make the fastest, cleverest, most beautiful people and call them Khajiit. The Khajiit must be the best climbers, for if Masa and Secunda fail, they must climb Kanafi's breath to set the moons back in their courses. The Khajiit must be the best deceivers, for they must always hide their nature from the children of Anur. The Khajiit must be the best survivors, for Noni will be jealous, and she will make the sands harsh and the forests unforgiving. And the Khajiit will always be hungry and at war with Noni. Not only did Azura change her favoured people to be fast, clever and beautiful, she also gave them gifts. She made them of many shapes, one for every purpose. She showed them the lunar lattice, so that they could more easily climb to the heavens to set the moons back on track, and so they would remain protected from the chaos of oblivion. And finally, she made the moons shine down upon the marshes, and this lunar light became moon sugar, the holiest of substances in elsewhere. The Khajiit owe everything to Azura, and their adoration for her has never faltered. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the Queen of Dawn and Dusk's other children. In the Morefic times, Azura, along with Boethia and Mephala, came to the Aldmer of Somerset and inspired a great exodus. It was Boethia, the Prince of Plots, who got their attention when he exposed the lies of Trinimac the Warrior God. The Deceiver Prince's potent display of dominance over the beloved Paragon was enough to provoke Veloth and his followers into leaving Somerset behind. The good Daedra guided Veloth's flock to Resdane, and the Change Ones were born. Azura may not have taken an active role in humiliating Trinimac, but she contributed significantly to the metamorphosis of the Kaima. Azura was the ancestor who taught the Kaima how to be different from the Ultima, showing them how best to wear their skin. That is how the pale old skin of Veloth and his dissident followers became the golden skin of the Kaima. She is considered by the Kaima to be a communal cosmic progenitor for the entire race. Her watchful presence is felt with every new dawn, as the sun's warmth provides the people with her maternal embrace. And at evenfall, Azura's incandescent display steals the Kaima until morning, when she graces them with her company once again. It's hard to take Azura for granted when the eastern and western horizons respectively are vivified by her at the beginning and ending of every day. Her sphere is hard to define, but it is so palpably ingrained in the lives of mortals. Thanks to Azura and the other good Daedra, the Kaima went from settlers in a strange new land to one of the most powerful and unique nations in Tamriel. Their Daedra-inspired culture was completely alien to outsiders, and in many ways, they were innovators. They bred fine warriors and skilled mages, and with Mafala's secrets at their disposal, they revolutionized politics, employing strategies of deception and assassination. They faced many adversaries in those early days of Resdane, but eventually they overcame one of their greatest enemies, the Nords of Skyrim, by forging an alliance with the Dwemer. And from the year 416 of the First Era to the year 700, the Kaima continued to grow in power and influence. But what went wrong in the year 700? Well, in this year, and the few years that followed, three of Indiril Nerevar's generals, including his queen, betrayed Azura and experienced her wrath. The fragile alliance between the Kaima and Dwemer finally reached breaking point when the Kaima learned of Chief Tonal Architect Kagranak's plans to attune the heart of Lorcan. The War of the First Council erupted and culminated at the Battle of Red Mountain. Kagranak turned his tools upon the heart, and he failed. And Nerevar said he saw Kagranak and all his Dwemer companions at once disappear from the world. In that instant, Dwemer everywhere vanished without a trace. Nerevar, Moon and Star, Champion of Azura, decided the best course of action was to call upon Azura and ask her for guidance. Vivek instead offered him advice, stating that we should preserve these tools in trust for the welfare of the Kaima people. And who knows, perhaps the Dwemer are not gone forever, but merely transported to some distant realm, from which they may someday return to threaten our security once again. Therefore, we need to keep these tools, to study them and their principles, so that we may be safe in future generations. 
Nerevar agreed to heed the counsel of his generals, despite having grave misgivings. He had only one condition, that they all together should swear a solemn oath upon Azura, that the tools would never be used in the profane manner that the Dwemer had intended. They all readily agreed, and swore their solemn oaths at Nerevar's dictation. In truth, the tribunal coveted the heart of Lorcan's powers, and were willing to turn to treachery in pursuit of them. Almalexia used poison candles, and Sophocil used poison robes, and Vivek used poisoned invocations. Nerevar was murdered. Vivek writes, For some years we kept the oaths we swore to Azura with Nerevar, but during that time, in secret, Sophocil must have studied the tools and divined their mysteries. And at last he came to us with a vision of a new world of peace, with justice and honour for nobles, and health and prosperity for the commoners, with the tribunal as immortal patrons and guides. And dedicating ourselves to this vision of a better world, we made a pilgrimage to Red Mountain, and transformed ourselves with the power of Kagranak's tools. And so their oaths to Azura were broken, and the Queen of Dawn and Dusk was betrayed by her own children. No sooner than they had completed their rituals and began to discover their newfound powers, the Daedra Lord Azura appeared and cursed them for their forsworn oaths. By her powers of prophecy, she assured them that her champion, Nerevar, true to his oath, would return to punish them for their perfidy, and to make sure such profane knowledge might never again be used to mock and defy the will of the gods. So for Syl, defiant and logical as the profane folk responsible for forging the tools, challenged her authority. He said, The old gods are cruel and arbitrary, and distant from the hopes and fears of Myrrh. Your age is past, we are the new gods, born of the flesh, and wise and caring of the needs of our people. Spare us your frets and chiding in constant spirit. We are bold and fresh, and will not fear you. Azura would not abide being scorned, and she manifested her curse. At that moment, all Kaima were changed to Dunma. Their skins turned ashen, and their eyes into fire. And then she offered her damning response. What you have done here today is foul beyond measure, and you will grow to regret it. For the lives of gods are not what mortals think, and matters that weigh only years to mortals weigh on gods forever. Let this mark remind you of your true selves who, like ghouls, fed on the nobility, heroism and trust of their king. This is not my act, but your act. You have chosen your fate, and the fate of your people, and all the Dunma shall share your fate, from now until the end of time. You think yourselves gods, but you are blind, and all is darkness. The tribunal had snatched divine power for themselves, and countless others suffered for their gain. Even as demigods, the tribunal were afraid of Azura's darkness. So Fasil, in his wisdom, presented this curse as a blessing to the Dunma people, and he denounced Azura, saying that the Dunma would not live as barbarians, trembling before ghosts and spirits as the Kaima had. For a time, the tribunal came out on top. As Sophocil had predicted, the Dunma would forget their old ways of worship, and it would take a long time before Azura's power might bring Nerevar back. But eventually they would answer for deriding Azura's compassion, and for wounding her vanity. I think the tribunal, even at the height of their power, knew this too. Not even Armalexia's staunch denial of her deeds would stop it. The Nerevarine returned in Third Era 427, and the reign of the Tribunal came to an end. Almalexia and Sophocil paid with their lives, while Vivek vanished, and Azura's vengeance was complete. There is another noteworthy instance of Azura's ire, in which a mortal made a mockery of her nurturing disposition, and suffered dearly for it. This is the story of Azura and the Box. Nachilbar was a wise old Dwemer who spent his twilight years trying to decipher the enigmatic nature of the Aedra and Daedra. There's a popular misconception, or maybe just a meme, that the Dwemer were atheists. But in the Elder Scrolls universe, where the existence of higher powers is not up for debate, being an atheist would require an impressive amount of ignorance. The Dwemer weren't non-believers, they were just blasphemers. They believed in the gods, but didn't blindly venerate them like many cultures do. They considered the gods fallible, and asserted that their own intellect could rival the Aedra and Daedra. Their technological innovations, like the living, steam-breathing automatons, were their equivalent to the divine ability to create life. 
Nachilbar therefore wished to demonstrate to his students that gods were not entirely omniscient and were capable of being tricked into self-doubt. Nachilbar knew there would be no better way to show this than by deceiving the most kind and trusting of the Daedra lords. So he asked his acquaintance, a Kaima priest, to summon a 